I've been really struck over the last uh, 24 hours about some of the parallels I've heard in discussions around nutrition coming from land and the situation we see um, in the ocean. However, the ocean really does seem to be missing from many of the fora that deal with uh, nutritional issues. So in order to kind of redress the balance in the diet of, the, uh, the ne of, of our two days, uh, we've got some fantastic speakers here who are experts in various issues around basically nutrition coming from the sea. I'm going to introduce them now, and then uh, we'll just ask them to come up one after the other. So to start off, uh, we have uh, Rashid Sumaila from the University of British Columbia. Uh, Rashid and I have uh, been working together for quite a few years now, including on the uh, Global Ocean Commission, which was based here at Somerville. Um, Rashid, I think I can say, is probably one of the world experts, if not the world expert, on fisheries economics, um, but also inevitably gets uh, tied up with a lot of policy around fisheries as well. Um, that would be followed by Al Harris, who I seem to bump into in all sorts of exotic locations around the world. Um, uh, Al actually uh, really is uh, the NGO Blue Ventures. He's been working um, out of Madagascar, but Blue Ventures have now moved into other uh, African states. Um, and really, uh, his focus of work has been working with communities to develop sustainable fisheries management at the, the local level. I'm sure he'll, he'll tell us more about that. Uh, Will McCallum um, is described by The Guardian as, or has been an environmental activist for the last 10 years or so. Um, he is now uh, the head of Greenpeace Oceans, and uh, hopefully Will will be able to bring in a different perspective or another perspective on some of the problems we face in terms of fisheries management. And finally, David Agnew, who I've worked with on environmental uh, issues around fisheries in the past and now works for the uh, Marine Stewardship Council. David really uh, is an expert in fisheries management, um, particularly the, the technical sides of um, basically trying to estimate how many fish we can take out of the sea and how we can do that in a sustainable uh, fashion. Um, the Marine Stewardship Council has be become the uh, probably the most uh, internationally recognised form of uh, fishery certification. So, uh, without more to do, I'll ask Professor Rashid Sumaila uh, to come up and kick off our session. Uh, this is what I hope to do in the 15 minutes I have. Uh, talk about fish, so I'll give you some numbers. I know some people are not uh, fish and marine people, so give some background. And then I go into the main uh, topic of the day and, and the two days, which is fish protein, sustainability, and power, the influence of power. And when I talk about power, I'll be talking mainly about policies, give an example, and I'll talk about fishery subsidies. How, how much we give up, we as citizens through our governments to the fishing sector, and how power plays in there. Then I talk about women in fisheries as one of the elements, and this connects a lot to the, the earlier talk we had, we, we had just about a few minutes ago. And finally, I'll talk about high seas, how we are exploiting high seas now, and make a connection to power in terms of your ability to fish with high technology out there and what it means for people around the world. And of course, a few words of conclusion. So this is just data for you. Uh, every year, we take out of the ocean about 120 million tons of fish, okay? 120 million. And if you change that into, into cows, mature cows, that's about 120 million fish cows we pull out of the ocean each year each year out of the ocean. Just think of that. In terms of the economics, this data, lots of dollars. In terms of food, that is also very important. We, fish is a, a, an important source of food. And jobs, jobs are really important. That's our latest estimate, about 260 million people. 
And when we looked at the top 10 countries, they are almost all large developing countries. India is one of them. Nigeria is one of them. And to me, this is one of the most important functions that fish are playing for the world. Just think of it. If you have 10 million, million, tens of millions of young men who would have nothing to do without fishing, and the fish goes away, just think about the security issues and all the troubles we'll all get. This is more important to me, actually, than the dollars in terms of keeping people busy. And then there is the recreational values, ecosystem values. And going back to the 120 million in terms of sustainability, just imagine what kind of system can sustain that, pulling out 120 million cow equivalents each year. So there are huge sustainability issues that we need to, to watch out for, all right? And therefore, we have all these kinds of problems. I mean, it's uh, sustainability. Some of you may have known this. Uh, this is a concept that captures what you do. If you get a, 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 an ocean or part of the ocean that has not been fished before, we start fishing. What do we do? We take the big fish. We take the big fish, the valuable fish, and slowly, this is what you get. And you see this around the world, uh, fishing down the food web. And then you have all the pollution issues, climate change we are not even talking about. So there are big issues as we go in to pull out this 120 million fish cows. We do a lot of other things, oil spills and so on. So now, uh, the rest of the talk, I'll be talking a lot about small scale and large scale. And small scale, large scale is defined very broadly and differently in different countries. But the main idea is large scale is large industrial fishing boats. And then you have the small scale, all the others, right? You can think of it. You go to rural India, people fishing with their lines and, and so on and so forth. And these are some of the things we like to see socially and economically from our fisheries. And if we compare the two, about two thirds of the total catch is, uh, is taken by large scale industrial fleets one third by the small ones. You think about these cuts, and this, these cuts are the situation where you, you catch fish you don't want because there's no market for it, for example, and you throw it back into the ocean, right? Most of it is taken by the life scale, almost nothing. Almost all that they catch is eaten by people, right? Then you look at here, uh, uh, amount of fish that is grounded and fed to other fish and pigs and so on, right? The fish meal and fish oil. Big chunk of the industrial, almost nothing here. And, and in terms of uh, fish, in terms of human consumption and so on. So all sorts of variables and, and things that actually where the small scale fishers actually do well, right? And the question is why are they not doing, they are very marginalized in most places and the question is why? And we'll touch a bit more, I'll talk more about the subsidies because that's work we spend a lot of time doing in my group. The subsidy is simply government handout, and, and that this connects to the talk you gave earlier, right? Where you set subsidies to the big guys, it's an investment, the small ones is a subsidy. So this essentially is a simple definition. There are many other definitions, but that's the main point. And what we're doing at the moment, this is really new research, which is being led by my student, uh, Anna Shubawa, She's doing her PhD, and what we are doing is, people have made estimates of total amount of subsidy that goes to the fishery sector, and the latest estimates is $35 billion a year that governments around the world give to the fishery sector. When I talk about this, I talk about it in terms of sustainability, because most of the subsidy actually encourages overfishing. And, and so what we are doing here to split and see how much of this goes to large scale and how much goes to small scale, and that tells you straight away. I've gone into arguments where politicians have told me we give subsidies because we want to help the poor and the small people. And the data is actually showing that this is not the case. Uh, and then in the, in the definition of subsidies, we talk about these ones. Not all subsidies are bad. Some can be good, right? If they help you to manage your fishery sustainably, we call them beneficial. Capacity enhancing like fuel, most of the subsidies that goes to the large scale actually are the so-called bad subsidies. They encourage overfishing. Okay, I have to move fast. It's telling me that. Women in fisheries, that's another piece of work that uh, a PhD student of mine is doing. 
uh, Sarah Harper, she's looking at this. And what we see is that if you look at formal fisheries management, there's hardly mention of women, as if women don't exist, actually. But frankly speaking, looking at the data, we see a lot of participation by women, and this leads to big issues, like those, those who I mentioned, right? Uh, it is in the literature. People have said if you are in rural Africa or Southeast Asia, a dollar that goes to a woman helps the household more than a dollar that goes to the guy, right? And, and, and so this is a, a big area we're doing. And the reason we don't see women much is this is usually what people think about when they think about fishing. You have to be large, you have to have a boat, you have to, all the formal stuff. But there's a lot going on on the small scale level that goes under the radar. And so we start looking at this, lots of data work and see evidence so far, 80 countries women participate. We have about 50 countries where there is a lot of participation. And so far our data is showing that in actual fishing, about 12% of the fishes we have found so far, 12% are women. And when it comes to the processing and, and no indirect, actually, majority are, are women around the world. So uh, this is work that is coming, and uh, there will be more to come. The last bit is about high seas fishing, and I spent a lot of time this we did with Alex. We did some work here. This is our ocean, and administratively, we split the ocean into exclusive economic zones of countries, and the high seas, the deep blue, blue side. But this is only for administration. The fish do not know this. The fish move. They don't care whether you are in the EU or out of the EU. They move, right? <laughs> so, so this is it's a global ocean, right? And, and so we, we look at the data. It's amazing. Most of the fish, especially in terms of value that we take, live both in the high seas and also in the, in the EEZs of coastal countries. So this was big for us when we discovered this. Meanwhile, there are only a few fish that live all their life in the high seas that we catch, the so-called offense of the ocean. So this tells you a lot, right? What you do in the high seas has consequences on what happens in the coast and vice versa. And so this, this was uh, something we published uh, with, with Alex. So essentially what I'm saying is this one. The ocean, you have one global ocean, they are all connected, what you do here affects what you do there. So the big guys in the high seas also affect the small guys out of the high seas. And that is, this is one piece of data which is also very strong. Only 10 countries in the world take 70% of all the values in the high seas. Remember the high seas is owned by all global citizens. It's our general, it's our common, common heritage, but only 10 countries. Food security consequences, inequality consequences, sustainability, lots of issues there. And, and so a number of us have already made proposals just close the high seas to fishing. Can you imagine how brave we can be? Just close the whole place. Because if you do that, then the fish, that part becomes a fish bank. The fish can hide there, grow, and, and then, and then and reach the rest so that small boats in Guinea-Bissau can also get that fish. Not only Taiwanese boats, for example. So that is uh, one, one conclusion we have come to. This is my final slide. This is the world. You have the environment, the, the ocean here, and we the people are in there doing all the stuff we do. We take the fish, we do all we do, and what do we do? We pump out the waste into the ocean again. And the way we do this is really important. If we're going to be sustainable, you cannot take too much, so far we're doing that, and you cannot put too much waste out there, and we're doing that. And to be able to fix this, you have to fix this power business, because power dictates all that we do, really. How I will tell you how you fish, what kind of equipment you use to fish, whether you use poison or you use trawlers that can destroy the bottom, or whether the fish you take actually goes to meet the needs of the people, right? Or just the 1% or 0.1% or whatever. And thank you very much for your attention. So very much. Um, I only have a few short minutes, so I'm going to share some reflections following Rashid's talk from my work over the last 15 years working on small-scale fisheries management, particularly in the, in the developing world in the Western Indian Ocean. 
We've heard from Rashid and previous speakers yesterday that, that global demand for seafood is soaring. It's now, according to the latest FAO data, at 167 million tons a year. The rate of growth of global supply of fish for human consumption has more than doubled the global human population growth rate for the last five decades. Soaring fish means, um, soaring demand means that, that many stocks are now in serious trouble. Around 90% of global fish stocks are either fully or over exploited. And this challenge is only going to become more acute as the human population increases towards nine, 11 billion by, by 2050. What does this mean for people? Fish is, of course, a food of choice here in the UK, where we have some 12,000 fishers. But in many parts of the world, it's an absolute necessity. Food is the prime, fish is the primary source of animal protein for over a billion people. And dependence on food for fish for nutritional security is much higher, of course, in, in the global south, in the developing world. From a livelihoods perspective, somewhere between 600 and 800 million people depend on fishing and aquaculture for livelihoods. 97% of those involved in fishing, in capture fishing, live in the developing world, and the overwhelming majority of them operating in the so-called small-scale sector. That's traditional and artisanal fisheries. What are some of the characteristics of these developing world small-scale fishers? Despite their big numbers, they tend not to be favored by national, regional, or global policy or decision-making. They often lack formal registration, title, or access rights to the resources upon which they depend, both for food and income, as well as in many cases, such as here in Madagascar, for their very cultural identity. And they're also often threatened by outside forces over which they have no control, as Rashid mentioned in the case of Guinea-Bissau. These include industrial, commercial, distant water fisheries, um, and various coastal threats, including increasingly aquaculture in many tropical regions. Um, many of the industrial vessels that we see operating in the south are so-called distant water fleets. That's foreign boats operating under fisheries partnership agreements with developing world coastal states. Over half of global fish exports now originate from developing countries. So small-scale fisheries that have traditionally supplied rural communities in the interior of developing countries are now increasingly forced to compete with export-orientated industrial fisheries that may be from other countries that are fishing purely for trade. And of course, these problems are compounded by illicit fishing, which accounts for at least 15% of global landings now, that's so-called IUU, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. I've spent much of the last 15 years working in the Mozambique Channel um, and in Madagascar. Um, this, these are the Vezu people of Madagascar, a traditional nomadic seafaring people. Madagascar has the population of Australia. It's one of the poorest countries on, on Earth. Over half of the children in Madagascar are stunted because of chronic malnutrition. Historically, the Vezu who inhabit the west coast of the country have migrated up and down the Mozambique Channel in search of uh, still viable fish stocks. Today, they're having to migrate further and further than ever before and stay away for longer periods, pushing the boundaries of the annual cyclone season, which is, of course, becoming more severe with climate change. This is an example of one of the habitats, one of the islands that the Vezu will migrate to. They'll live on these islands for up to nine months of, of the year with no shelter, no infrastructure, no fresh water, no schools, no health facilities whatsoever. And many of these islands are inundated increasingly at high tide. This is a home um, in a photograph taken earlier this year. The Vezu are representative of what I term the not so small scale fishing sector. Communities that are quite literally living on the edge of climate change, on the front line of the global fishing economy. Um, the push factors of collapsing fisheries, forcing them to, to push the boundaries of safety and the seasons, the fact that they are really marginalized within their own countries in the face of international distant water fleets, forcing them to target increasingly unsustainable stocks, the pull factors of increasingly lucrative, increasingly predominantly Asian markets for stocks and fisheries that are incredibly unsustainable, such as, such as this one. 
it's not all bleak. We work extensively with communities like this in, in the Western Indian Ocean, particularly trying to secure access rights for these fisheries. Um, and many of the stocks that these communities target, particularly invertebrate species, are phenomenally resilient to management. Last year, we published a study that showed monthly internal rates of return of 90% from, derived from these communities managing inshore small-scale fisheries themselves once they'd secured access rights. That means communities literally doubling their money in a month. There's very few assets on earth that can, can show that kind of profitability. Um, so I was asked to provide a little bit of texture from my work. I've definitely gone over time, um, but I hope I can really emphasize the point that, that, that these so-called small-scale fisheries really exist out of sight, out of mind. Um, and when we're talking about power and fishing and food, I think that communities like the Vezu in Madagascar are incredibly representative of the challenges that we face. Thanks. So I'll just give a brief overview of Greenpeace. I'm sure you all know the logo and have seen the Rainbow Warrior. Um, but Greenpeace, um, so the way we work is we're international. We operate in about 40 countries, and all of our campaigns in those countries, that, well, 80% of our campaigns are meant to be international campaigns. So the idea is we're working on global issues. And obviously, fisheries is one of those. Uh, but probably the thing most distinctive about Greenpeace and what most of you will know us for is the way we work. So investigations, exposés, and of course, non-violent direct action. Um, and why do I kind of lay that out? Because in the complex world of fisheries management, environmental management, Greenpeace has a particular role to play in that ecosystem, which we say as the more confrontational end of tackling power. Um, so all of our global campaigns really fit within this triangle, or we see it as a triangle, where the top point are the environmental boundaries, so these nine tipping points that we have. And another point on the triangle is the need to shift power dynamics. And then the third is about changing mindsets. So whenever we pitch a new campaign to our global organization, it has to meet those three criteria. We have to demonstrate how it's doing that. So I thought I'd just outline very briefly two campaigns that we have uh, that I think are doing that in fisheries. The first, uh, more traditional Greenpeace, is the kind of top-down power. Where does the power in the fisheries world lie at the moment? Well, one place is certainly with Thai Union, who are the focus of our global tuna campaign. They're the world's biggest seafood company, and they are currently pursuing a strategy of highly aggressive growth, buying up brands in many countries all around the world, including now moving into the Middle East and China. They own John West in this country, uh, Chicken of the Sea, which is the US largest tuna brand for any Americans. Um, they're a huge company, and their impact on the ocean has been described by some scientists as that of a keystone species. So they are having an equivalent level on the ocean as you know, one of the ocean's ma major species. Um, and whilst they are continuing to make a profit, we're not prepared to let them off the hook. We appreciate changing supply chains to be more sustainable, changing supply chains to take care of the workers working within them is highly difficult, but they're making a load of money out of it. And, um, and we're kind of, we're there at the moment. We've had our boats out on the sea pulling out the fish aggregating devices, and we're attacking them in supermarkets, in brands, at distribution centers, wherever we can, uh, trying to enforce that top-down change. The other campaign I wanted to mention, uh, which is a totally different place of power, is, um, is one that I've worked on for about four years now, which is with local fishermen in the UK. The reason why I wanted to talk about this one is uh, we've just voted out of the European Union, and fish was a big part of the debate. Um, fishermen were rallied right around the UK coast to vote out, and in the one survey that I saw from the University of Aberdeen, I think 92% of fishermen they interviewed were voting out, um, although 77% thought that this would have no impact on the trade. Um, so there's a, there are many reasons for this, but um, really, it's, uh, the reason why I brought it up here is lots of countries look at the common fisheries policy, the, UK's, uh, the UK and Europe's um, common fisheries policy, as an example of how you might manage fisheries. Well, all of these fishermen voted out because of the common fisheries policy. So whatever I might think from Greenpeace about how you know, those reforms in 2013 were fantastic, they really put hand power back in the hands of member states to change decisions and to, to do the right thing, the fishermen didn't see that, and the change on the water was minimal. So if we're looking at 
implementing similar fisheries policies, regional fisheries policies, in the way that, for example, Thailand and Indonesia are working on at the moment, we need to look at the lessons that can be learned. Which is, if we don't engage those with the least power, when they're given the option to exert their power, they're going to fight back. And that's what I think has happened here. But looking forward, where we are with these fishermen is a huge opportunity. It's not all doom and gloom, but it certainly put us back to the starting blocks with our work with the government on fisheries. Thank you. Thank you very much for all my previous speakers and also for putting me at the end so that I can have the last laugh. Um, I, I believe what I'm meant to be doing here, and in fact what as panelists we're meant to be doing, is taking Rashid to task <laughs> on his, uh, on his um, points. But there are a number of things that have come up here that I, I'd just like to touch on. Um, I've only got a single slide. It just says what we are. We are the Marine Stewardship Council. We um, have an eco-label uh, and a standard that we've based on international norms as agreed by FAO back in the early 1990s and then not applied by governments since. And still, um, there are an awful lot of governments that have agreed to apply these international norms and legal management systems and haven't been doing so. What the MSC does is it comes along and it offers people an alternative way to manage what they're doing. It empowers them in that way because we don't impose it. It's a voluntary program. People use it in different ways. It's a tool. And the number of different ways continues to, to startle us. So where are we at? We're often criticized to being a, a, a large industrial program. Uh, we do have around about 10% of the global volume of capture fisheries, wild capture fisheries in the program. 25% of our fisheries are small-scale fisheries. Um, and 13% by volume are in the developing world, 10% by number in the developing world. Those are not big enough, and, but it's a challenge to work in the developing world, as many people will, say, will, will tell you. Someone, and I'm sorry I um, didn't meet you before, the, the, right at the beginning, the big soapbox was, we've got payoffs and compromises to make here, and we do have payoffs and compromises, and they're not actually that obvious. And I want to tackle this small is good, large is bad issue, because that's often what we perceive. And quite a lot of the discussion here is about empowering small scale, empowering the unempowered, and that's absolutely correct to do. But the MSC was essentially set up to solve environmental problems, and by the way, it's solving social problems as well. We often hear that large is bad. Well, large fishery, large operations are more efficient than small operations. They are very often lower carbon footprint per tonne of fish, significantly. One of the largest carbon footprints per tonne of fish are lobster fisheries, like this guy. Because you drive out there and you bring back two lobsters and you've used fuel the whole way. They're controllable because there are fewer of them. And they can access fish for livelihoods and they can access fish for consumption that others can't. So while it would be delightful to close the high seas, actually, some of these small-scale fisheries could not catch the fish. Why is this important? Because fish is the most globally traded natural commodity that we've got. It goes backwards and forwards across the world the whole time. There's a very large fishery for mackerel in the North Atlantic that's caught by North Atlantic vessels, large-scale vessels, highly technologically important, there's a similar fishery for herring. A large proportion of that is imported by the Gulf of Guinea countries, particularly Nigeria. It feeds West Africa, as well as the fish from West Africa feeding West Africa. An awful lot of the small pelagic fish that are caught in West Africa by West Africans and by the, the um, distant water nations that they have licensed to fish, particularly in Mauritania. Some of it is exported, but some of it is entrained back within West Africa. So it's not a simple small is good, large is bad. Small can be good, but small can also be bad. Small fisheries are difficult to control and manage. In the UK, great example, let's leave the EU and all our fisheries problems will be solved. We are going to have to share our fish with everybody else still in the EU. 
The fish we don't have to share are those that are in the 12 nautical mile zone, the small scale fisheries. The MSC with DEFRA did a review of all the fisheries in the small scale sector in the UK. There are 400 individual fisheries. You cut them by management and species and type of fishing. Something like 80% of our large scale offshore fisheries that participate in European cod, haddock, mackerel fisheries in the UK are certified. Only about 3% of the inshore fisheries are certified and only about another 5% could be certified because they are not managed in a way that is very sustainable. So it's not a simple issue. It's not a simple issue at all. What I want to leave you with, because I've only got one minute, is that actually it's up to those that are involved in the industry to make these changes. And we need to empower them to do so. We have created that empowerment tool in the MSC. It's not globally and widely applicable at the moment, and we're working to make that more. But there are two cases I want to bring to your attention. There's recently the first Indian fishery, the Ashtamudi clam fishery from southern Kerala, got certified. They have been exporting, but they also sell some of it in, um, uh, locally. And they received a price premium, much to our surprise, from the local market, which recognized that they were now being able to be seen as an internationally highly performing fishery. It's fantastic fishery. It's hand-gathered, um, hand-processed, and sold from um, a, a bay within southern Kerala. South African hake fishery, interesting fishery, large scale. Um, we did an analysis of the economics of it, which was published quite, quite recently. The conclusion of that was because hake is an internationally traded species, it's been sold into northern Europe. By becoming certified, they accessed markets in northern Europe rather than Spain, which the price was going down. It secured their markets. They've got um, a value, a net present value of around about 35% over what it would be if it wasn't certified. They secured about 13,000 jobs, and these are jobs in the skilled and semi-skilled processing industry that employ women and men in South Africa um, at a higher average wage than the um, local community. And they've been able to argue against the government trying to withdraw money for support of research and management of that fishery. So it's a win-win-win there, and the environmentalists are delighted with the situation because they've also stopped killing lots of albatross. So if you put these tools in the hands of those people who can use them and help them to use them, it can work. And that's my end. Thank you. I think the best thing to do is to give our speakers uh, an opportunity to maybe respond to each other. Mm -hmm. Should I start? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a very interesting panel, very diverse views, which is always good, because then you get a, a broader view of things. Uh, one thing I didn't get to say is the problem uh, that, that I think most of us in this room uh, would agree is one of the biggest problem we have in the world today is that of distribution, the big gaps that we have heard about where just a small percentage of the world runs off with most of the, the benefits. And, and, and I think it, it shows here in fisheries too that is uh, an issue. And, and there's no straight answer to it. So David, you are right. There's no clean way to do this. But this is a big problem and we need to, to tackle it. So the issue is not uh, large is bad. The issue is that large is probably dominating the sea. So that is the issue. So the idea is what is the economists will say, what is the optimal level of large and small? And that is what we are, we are, we are talking about essentially. And it's true that if you close the high seas completely, you, there may be some fishes you cannot catch, right? And, and we try to look at that. The, the, there's just one percent of the or so of the fish species that are caught commercially that are known to live only in the, in the high seas, and so you wouldn't be able to catch them. But one percent, you can let that go, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. So if you can go for the 90, 95 percent, so this is just my initial comment, and we can get going. Okay. 
I would agree with those remarks entirely. I think we must be wary of a narrative that um, criticizes the large scale and industrial sector and, mm. and simply simplifies the situation as large is bad, mm. small is good. David gave some very compelling examples of um, high seas fisheries for pelagic species that are feeding West Africa, for instance, and the South African industrial hake trawl fishery that is probably the single biggest employer in the city of, of, of Cape Town mm -hmm. um, and is accelerating improvements in, in, in the sustainability of that fishery and those livelihoods as a result of a global eco-label. I would agree with Rashid because I think that whilst we have to respect the in, enormous global importance of these industrial fisheries, the balance of power favours these fisheries at the expense of small-scale fisheries far too frequently. Um, we have with us today one of our, our collaborators, Dr. Fred Lemac from, from French organization Bloom. Um, when Fred was at the University of British Columbia, we, we published a catch reconstruction that Fred led on that attempted to calculate the shadow fishing that wasn't accounted for within national catch data that was submitted by the government of Madagascar mm. to the FAO. And we found that since 1950, the government had consistently underreported nat national catch by up to 500% every year from 1950 to 2008, simply because of an accidental omission of this so-called small-scale sector. And that finding is consistent with most developing coastal states. The global analysis of UBC's catch reconstructions was published earlier this year, and, it, and I think it found that we're, we're underestimating global take by about half. Now, what that means at a policy level is that these people do not have a voice or a seat at the table. So when contracts are negotiated for distant water vessels in particular, the interests of communities are often completely omitted. For instance, the largest contract of a holder of a, of a fishing um, contract with, again, Madagascar, which has one of the largest EEZs in Africa, exclusive economic zones, is with the EU. My taxes fund that agreement. It funds about 130 vessels to fish tuna in Madagascar's exclusive economic zone. The last agreement that was paid before by the EU gave Madagascar 1.3 million euros for the right to fish for a landed catch value that's about 50 million euros. Now, that is entirely unequitable, um, and these, these, these decisions and contracts are not negotiated transparently, and the EU contract represents the best-case scenario of about 30 such contracts that that a given coastal state currently holds with distant water fleets. Um, so I think we have a huge job ahead of us to really champion the rights of these people to food for their food security and, and the, the, the potential economic and demographic consequences to these very food insecure and often impoverished nations of a failure to correct this imbalance could be absolutely enormous. Okay. Um, I suppose, yeah, just a well, one, two, one thought was uh, other than Al, I don't think any of us mentioned demand. Um, and that was, a, I think, is always a notable absence when we're talking about environmental sustainability is the relatively few species of fish that we eat uh, and the kind of the onus <laughs> being on consumers and retailers perhaps to increase the diversity as one route towards greater sustainability. Um, and the other one is just, yeah, on the balance. Um, unemployment in coastal towns around the UK is much higher than elsewhere. And a lot of that can be put down to demise of the small-scale local fishing industry. So those large pelagic trawlers that are fishing in the UK's waters, at the very least, could be landing some of their catch here um, or looking at other ways to incentivize local jobs. And I, I think it's just another example of that balance being slightly out of kilter. And Greenpeace are often characterized as being uh, only on the side of the small. And... Um, I'd say, yeah, more often than not, we are, because we see that balance as, as uh, out of place at the moment. Okay, David. Um, yeah, I don't want anyone to think that I'm not um, in favour of some of that small-scale redistribution. I think that has been a problem in the UK, particularly. It's actually not a European problem, it's a UK problem. Even within the European community, um, the UK, for 40 years, has refused <laughs> to support its fishing industry. Um, that was after we lost the Icelandic fishing wars, they washed their hands of it, whereas Spain didn't. 
Um, so I, I think that's a local problem. Um, in terms of the uh, incursions of foreign vessels, I do think that's a problem. I do think that these access agreements have been massively inequitable. And mm. the EU has been a culprit with that. Um, uh, but there are others that are more of a culprit. The interesting thing, though, is for many of these fisheries that they are giving access agreements to, the coastal states don't actually have the, um, the ability to catch it themselves. This has blown up a lot in the Pacific, where the um, coastal states have come together in something called the Forum Fisheries um, Agency, and they um, have tried to empower themselves and are now wishing to um, increase the capacity for themselves to take that fish locally. The amount of fish that they need for local consumption is relatively small, but it's an economic argument with them. So bringing some of that power back against the distant water fishing nations is definitely something that we would need to do. However, the power of the markets and the power of the way that these vessels work, particularly the Chinese fleet and the Southeast Asian fleet, is they are global operators, and most of our companies are global operators as well, in the same way that you've got with Tai Uni. Thank you very much, um, David. Uh, I mean, I'd like to just, just raise a, a, a few points from um, the, the talks we've had this morning. Um, the first one is, I mean, we, we, we've heard about the South African hate fleet, which does seem to be a fantastic example of, uh, you know, an improving large-scale fishery. And indeed, I think they're also primary objectors to proposals to mine phosphates uh, in the sea off South Africa as well, which is uh, quite interesting. Um, but having said that, they've improved their uh, uh, means of dealing with seabird bycatch. We're still seeing 160,000 petrels and albatrosses caught per year as bycatch in longline fisheries um, globally. So I think the point there is, how do you actually spread uh, these examples of good practice amongst the rest of the in industry? Basically, how do we get the rest of the industry to clean um, its act up? Um, the uh, other point that I would like to make, and this is very much coming from some of the work we've done. Uh, obviously, some of these forms of fishing are damaging to the environment, and in particular, I'm thinking about bottom trawling. Um, you know, how do we get the balance between uh, where these fisheries operate and the need to uh, conserve the environment and preserve other ecosystem functions? Uh, as I said yesterday, you know, there is some evidence that in some circumstances bottom trawling might actually improve fisheries productivity, but at cost to other uh, ecosystem functions. So um, I'd perhaps like uh, all of you and the audience as well to think about how we actually strike this balance. And I've certainly witnessed the fisheries industry ferociously respond to any attempt to limit uh, the area in which uh, they can fish. And mm. I guess that the situation we've reached is a very polarised one where they automatically oppose any attempt to uh, reduce their efforts, um, whereas obviously there's rising evidence and, and concern about the environmental impacts of those fisheries. Thank you.